Welcome everyone. I'm Nova Bhattacharya, past president of Toronto Arts Council and artistic director of Nova Dance. I welcome you all here today. David Kalenda will be providing ASL interpretation. You can pin David's video block so that it is the largest on your screen. You will need the speaker view selected in the top right hand corner to do this. Thank you to David for working with us today. Today is May 14, 2020. We are living, we are living. We are living in the province of Ontario where our state of emergency has been extended to June 2nd and the city's cultural venues remain closed until at least June 30th. We are mourning. We are mourning the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people across the globe and grieving the transformation of our humanity into cold statistics. As a community of art makers, we find ourselves in a highly charged moment. As dancer Jill Cato of Cache Dance has so eloquently stated, we are creating in a time that is actually recreating us. I invite you now to join me in a moment of connection to the land, to Mother Earth, to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Wendat, and to take the time to try and find a deeper meaning in those words. Today, I'm thinking about the meaning of Haudenosaunee, people building an extended house, or people of the long house and their metaphoric intention that people are meant to live together as families in the same home. I invite you to take a moment to consider how a global, global pandemic is unraveling the things we thought we knew and creating the opportunity for us to rethink and reimagine the future. As difficult as the times are, there is much to give us hope. You are giving us hope. The way you are exhibiting leadership and stewarding your own organizations, the generosity and compassion that individual artists are sharing, and the way that all of you are working to uphold the place of the arts in society. You're inspiring. Also inspiring is the fact that people in this city are taking to the streets to have dance parties, socially distanced, distanced ones, of course, and, and the ritual every night of people expressing the rhythms of their bodies as they beat on pots and pans in a ritual of support for healthcare and other essential workers. A city that feels its heartbeat so deeply is a city will dance boldly into the future. The structure for the next hour is as follows. We'll have an update from Julie de Brusen, the MP for Toronto Danforth. Then an update from Councillor Gary Crawford and Pat Tobin, Director of Arts and Culture Services, City of Toronto. Then Claire Hopkinson, Director and CEO of Toronto Arts Council and Toronto Arts Foundation. And finally, we'll have 20 minutes to put questions you've submitted to our panelists. Thank you again for being here today. I am pleased to now welcome MP for Toronto Danforth and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, Julie, Juliet de Bruson. Thank you very much. And Nova, thank you for that introduction because that was that was a really beautiful way um, to bring us together and to start this off because it's been hard not seeing each other and, and to be kept apart. And it's good to have these opportunities to, to talk uh, using Zoom and all of those technologies, but it's not the same. So it's, it's really nice to have those reminders about the connections and uh, I was happy to be invited. So thank you for the invitation. And, and 
it's a really important chance to catch up and to hear from you as to, to what's happening here in the arts community in Toronto. I, I was inspired to see how quickly the Toronto Arts Foundation stepped up just pretty much immediately to help uh, local artists and, and to really do an amazing job to show that support. And we know that arts and culture is so important to, to our country. I, we're having a real moment now, I think where people are, are taking that moment to, to recognize it. Um, so it's something that maybe a lot of us on this call already knew, but, but right now uh, people are relying on the arts for entertainment and also for, for solace in a really, really difficult time. Uh, I also though wanna highlight because this is the other important part about arts and culture we don't always talk about enough, which is it's also really an important economic driver. We certainly see it here in our city and it's 3% of our GDP for our country. So just, just I always think it's important that we highlight that part as well um, as we kind of go forward and we talk about it. But um, you're right, the, the closures have had a really very severe impact on our creative industries here in the city and across our country. And that's been a focus for us at, at the federal government level uh, as to how to respond and to provide that support uh, for our creative industries. Not something that I just wanted to recognize that, you know, I'm the one talking to you right now, but there are a lot of people who are all in their separate homes, you know, at their kitchen tables all across this country who are working within ministry and the department. We have some of them on this uh, town hall with us and they're also listening and they are putting in tireless hours. So I know right now we have Irene, Richard and Brendan on the line, there might be some others too. Um, just know there's a whole team out there that's working to, to come up with all the programs to help with the creative industries. So some of the things happened kind of earlier on which was just trying to speed up what program funding was there. So for example, with aid to publishers, trying to speed up CAVCO credits, um, those types of pieces. Um, also with Canada Council, trying to speed up some of its funding at the front end. But in the past, um, in the past week, you will have just heard about more details about $500 million in funding that came from the federal government to support the creative industries. And that's going to be the part that really we should all be looking at right now for, for having a big impact because the goal of that funding is to help to keep our organizations going and to, to actually help to make sure that workers in the arts industry are supported, particularly with those who are freelance and who are, um, who are self-employed who might not be able to access things like the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. So it'll be coming out in two phases. Uh, the first phase is going to be going to existing, um, for lack of a better word, clients of Heritage and of the Candidate Council. The reason it's designed that way is for speed. It's really to try and get funding out as quickly as possible. And the good news about that is that the way it's organized, you don't have to apply for it if you're an existing client. Um, it's actually that they're going to be reaching out to you. So it's really to try and make it as easy as possible and as quickly as possible. But phase two is the next part. And that's the part that's going to try and take into account those organizations that aren't existing clients. So there is a second phase and that's accounted for within the money that's been allocated. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, I give some comfort there that there's another phase to it within the 500 million. But people who already are receiving funds from heritage and through heritage programs through Canada Council, um, you will be as part of the phase one, you'll be hearing from, from people shortly. So that's, that's a part. And the goal for that funding is to actually try and get that first wave of funding out by the first week of June. So that's, that's the goal on that. Um, I also want to take into it, just, just let you know before I let you go, these kinds of town halls and all of the feedback we're getting from arts organizations and artists is really important because it's also where you see tweaks and changes being made to existing programs as we go. So for example, with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, uh, the fact that uh, 
we, it was changed so that people could earn up to $1,000 and still receive it, but also that royalties would not be included as part of that $1,000. Um, that was all from what we heard from artists and creators who were giving us that kind of response and telling us that that was what was needed. So uh, also that this conversation is really important because it's how uh, we get the information we need to be able to keep um, to keep working on the programs to make sure they're responding to the needs on the ground. Oh, I know that there's going to be some time for questions and, and I'll leave it to there, but just to thank you for including me and to let you know it's not the end of the conversation when this hour is up. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Gary? Thank you. Uh, and, and I too want to thank you, Nova, for your uh, introduction. Uh, it was uh, very touching and um, I think we need this um, kind of conversation that we're having right now. Um, I've had the opportunity to be a city councillor for the last 10 years, um, and I've been very involved with Claire. Of course, I'm a member of the Toronto Arts Council, but I, I've had the opportunity to really see how the creative heart and soul of this city runs. Um, and when we have these challenges, I guess, um, creativity and the people who come out to sort of support us, uh, at all levels uh, are the creative people in the city and we're starting to see that now. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, MP De Bruzen uh, and her colleagues at the federal government for uh, coming out uh, and supporting these measures. That $500 million is a critical, uh, important, uh, when you're talking about money, I think that initial $500 for the culture sector is, sector is very important, um, especially for the cultural workers and the organizations and, and we're going to be seeing all of that. Um, and again, I want to thank everybody who have participated in a lot of the um, roundtables that myself and Mayor Tory have been having. As uh, uh, MP De Bruyne mentioned, it's important that we speak to everybody. We, uh, just after March, the Mayor and I reached out uh, as quickly as possible to many, many different sectors all across the city. Arts and culture, of course, was one of them. Uh, we wanted to listen. We wanted to hear recognizing the challenges, but in the listening and the hearing, we now start to, as you can see, getting to the other side of where we're at. We're not all the way there yet, but starting to develop the, um, the processes and everything that we need to do to ensure a, a, a safe uh, but economic recovery. So these conversations have been critically important. Um, I myself uh, have heard um, over dozens, from dozens of Toronto artists, arts organizations, cultural workers, really from mid, um, um, mid-March and, and again the, the mayor set up what's called the mayor's task force for economic support and recovery. Um, what we heard were the impacts of COVID-19 on you, on everybody else, um, but we also heard that we need to take action and you know not only from the city's perspective but from the provincial and the federal government. So it was critically important too um, is all three levels have to be working well together and I think you are seeing that when you're looking at provincial, federal, and all the municipalities across the city, and specifically Toronto. Um, we are working together, and I think that's a really important factor as we move forward. Um, while we are about ready to complete the report, we're working on a report right now, and I have to give uh, hats off to Pat Tobin, who'll be next. He'll be talking a bit about um, some of the work we're doing. Um, but this report will be going to a larger task force um, that will inform where the city is going to be going. Um, and the future directions and actions that the city is going to have to take. Um, we actually, the report will be, I think, finalized in the next day or two of this, will be going off to the um, this task force. Um, but again, we wanted to hear um, from the participants today, along with um, the Toronto Music Advisory Committee. Again, music is a big component of this, and we also want to make sure we heard from them. So I'm hopefully by the end of today, we'll be able to finish this and get it off to the, the bigger report. Um, but I just want to talk a bit about some of the themes, um, and there'll be no surprises to most of the people here uh, that are going to be emerging or have emerged. Um, number one, maintain and advance equity gains that are at risk and support with vulnerable workers. We heard that over and over again, and that's going to be a comprising a big part of the, <coughs> the report. Support cultural sector business continuity and key institutions across the whole city. Um, recognize that when you're looking at the support, a lot of that is financial. A lot of that is liquidity and how do we support financially but there will be other means that we're going to be looking at supporting um, business and uh, key institutions and digital we have heard and i'm sure there's no surprise when you're looking at the creative uh, economy um, improving digital infrastructure and adaptation so again as we're moving forward the city specifically we're looking at many different opportunities to um, 
to, to look at digital and digital transformation. Uh, we're also going to be looking to leverage culture and support strong neighborhoods in a healthy, multi-centered city. Um, now, that's been a theme that we have had and we continue to have across the city with the Toronto Arts Council and many other organizations, and we're going to be continuing that. Uh, now, these themes, or, or something close, will help frame this report that the Mayor and I will be bringing, as I've said. Um, and I want to assure you, um, as, as uh, MP de Bruzen has mentioned, your voices are being heard. We are listening, uh, and we are acting, and that is forming the decisions that we're doing right now. Um, a couple things too. Since uh, the last virtual town hall, um, operating grants, and, and Claire knows this uh, far too well, that have gone out to the city clients and we're expecting uh, uh, the Toronto Arts Council, fund, Council funding grants um, out for 2021. Um, as soon as we can get them, that's critically important. And our support for the arts, by the way, has not changed a waiver from my perspective. Um, and we're also looking at um, getting some property tax relief out to music venues. That's just one of the examples that will be in the report. Um, and I also wanted to mention too, we are fully committed to the year, or the celebration of the year of public art. Um, that was scheduled for 2021 and we're continuing with the planning of that. Now, as you can see in the media, uh, the city has been dealing with some significant financial pressures due to COVID-19. Um, we recognize our challenges and we're working closely with our partners at the uh, federal and uh, provincial level. Um, but you know, the City of Toronto can't spend our way out of that. Um, the Mayor and I have been very clear that as much as we would like to, um, we find a challenge at the city municipal level to be able to spend our way out of that. Uh, but what we're looking at doing is finding creative solutions and creative partnerships. Again, when I'm talking about partnerships, province and the federal government are key, key um, um, partnerships are partners with us um, and we're looking for ways to help Toronto artists and arts organizations to lead and um, really restart the recovery and the rebuild of uh, the city which we all all need to do so again I want to thank everybody for coming out today I appreciate this opportunity to not only hear from you but to speak um, we also need to let you know what we're doing um, and one of the things I've heard in speaking to the not only in the arts community but even residents in my ward um, is what's happening um, we need to know and where are we at and I think that's critically important that we ensure that we give right proper information to everybody. So on that, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Gary. Pat, can you share some thoughts with us now? Sure. Uh, thank you, Noah. And um, I'd actually like to uh, thank Noah for the incredibly beautiful and moving uh, opening that she brought um, and reminding us of, of what's truly important. Um, I'd like to thank uh, MP De Bruzen as well, and as both she and Council Crawford have said, the level of collaboration uh, among funders is better than I think many of us have seen in years, and, and that's a really good thing. But it's also taking its cue from the broader cultural sector, which has been collaborating highly effectively, whether it's advocacy or coming together on joint initiatives like Urgent and others. So it's been amazing to watch that. Uh, I'm just going to touch a bit on uh, update on operations, a little bit on some announcements that come out in the last uh, couple of weeks, and then talk a little bit uh, about what's uh, next. So just by way of operations, uh, you may have seen in the media conversations around uh, city staff working to shore up essential services such as shelters and long-term care homes. So that has been something that the staff at Economic Development and Culture have been doing. Um, and uh, I'm really proud of them for doing that and it certainly is really challenging uh, work and, and rewarding uh, ultimately. Um, so those redeployments continue and, and will wind down. I mentioned now just uh, that your service levels as clients of Economic Development and Culture might have changed. We're trying to ensure that we stay in touch with you, uh, even if some of us are, are not at their desks. Uh, and so we've introduced things like a, a new a newsletter and uh, we'll continue to make sure that we, we're there available to you. Um, the city, uh, further to, to Councillor Crawford's update, uh, is making a few, uh, has made some minor reductions in uh, staff. We've had some minor layoffs in EDC and that's for services that are deemed non-essential, such as uh, if museums are shut uh, and there are staff associated with running those programs, um, we waited as long as we could, but have, uh, have taken a step to lay some off and be able to recall them as soon as we move into the restart and uh, recover period. I wanna recognize as well though, that I say that knowing fully well, the security available to uh, public sector workers, that's unavailable to many of the people on the call. So wanna, want to recognize that and also um, 
note that as Councillor Crawford had it, uh, and, and Peter Bruzen mentioned with respect to the Rapid Relief Fund from the Toronto Arts Foundation, the position of vulnerable workers uh, and the makeup of vulnerable workers in this city in the cultural sector has uh, been born foremost in mind by everybody uh, that I'm talking to among funders, uh, those in the city, certainly Councillor Crawford, uh, in carrying that forward in the task force that he mentioned. Uh, and it will supports for vulnerable workers will absolutely form uh, parts of the responses that uh, that we'll be working on. Um, among the other areas that Council Crawford referred to, uh, digital transition, uh, neighborhoods, uh, strengthened institutions, etc. Um, to note that, uh, as Councilor Crawford said, there's a Toronto Office of Recovery and Rebuild that was announced now about three weeks ago. Uh, Saad Rafi has joined the city and is leading up that. Uh, one of the pillars of that work is a cluster around business, culture, and restarts, uh, effectively the, the tourism and, uh, and recovery of major events. Um, so we'll be working to support that, and I think in the coming weeks you'll hear a little bit more about what their focus will be. In the interim, uh, we continue to work to deliver things that we've been hearing come out of the roundtables that uh, people need. Um, folks have already mentioned the Rapid Relief Fund. Uh, just this week, Monday, we announced another uh, measure to support artists and arts organizations. It's a partnership with Shopify called Shop Here. Uh, so we'll circulate that link to folks after this call, but it will allow you to, uh, to access e-commerce technology and actually to have a website built through a number of tech sector volunteers. Uh, and so that should hopefully be a benefit to some folks. The Arts at Home initiative rolled out, a good example of partnership. Harborfront, National Ballet Center, Prologue for the Performing Arts, TO Live, et cetera, uh, pulling together a unified platform to make available, particularly to parents who are now suddenly homeschooling, really good, excellent arts, tech, uh, arts education material online um, as a means also of helping these organizations uh, continue to, to have staff working uh, and to promote, uh, promote their content as well. Uh, next up for us is going to be the the property tax subclass that Councillor Crawford mentioned. This will be an effort to try to reach live music venues who were among the first to close and are likely to be among the last to reopen during the crisis. So we'll be bringing forward a measure to uh, Council uh, as soon as, uh, as we can do so. Uh, please stay tuned for more on that. Uh, with respect to uh, what is next up beyond that, uh, it'll be the work um, of responding to the recommendations Councillor Crawford has just mentioned uh, in the report uh, from the round tables. So he outlined those themes uh, that will uh, be given to the mayor this week and will help inform the work of the Toronto Office of, uh, of Recovery and Rebuild uh, insofar as the, our recovery plan for the culture sector. We're gonna keep uh, talking to you to make sure uh, as this situation continues to evolve we hear from you both what your needs are as they evolve and what your recommendations, your ideas for recovery measures will be. Uh, tomorrow will be a meeting uh, for the DeNova's uh, great unpacking of, of the origins of Haudenosaunee uh, with Indigenous arts leaders who uh, will provide us, I'm sure, really good advice uh, about how to, how to think uh, with a long arc about the recovery. Uh, and what uh, what we need to do in the immediate term to take care of uh, particularly the most vulnerable uh, among us. So I'll leave it at that, uh, but thank you all for attending. Uh, thank my co-panelists and thank them. Thank you, Pat. We'll come back to you later with some questions, of course. Claire? Thanks very much, Nova, and again for your beautiful introduction as always, and thank you uh, to Julie uh, to Gary and Pat for being here and to David for helping out today. But also thanks to everybody who's taking the time uh, today to be on this call. And uh, it's great to read some of your comments and questions in the chat room today. So we've heard that both the federal government and the city have been working very, very quickly and uh, to respond to the extraordinary circumstances we find ourselves in. Toronto Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Foundation have also been intent on delivering support and assistance as effectively as we can. And you know, we know that each one of you has also been responding to this crisis very quickly, canceling performances, changing seasons, adopting digital platforms, 
planning for significant change overnight. But it's also true that the enormity of this challenge we are facing is far greater than any one individual organization or our quick thinking can solve. If we're gonna come through this well, we're gonna to have to work together. So off the top, I just wanted to say, and I hope you know this, that the Toronto Arts Council and Foundation, our primary objective is always the well-being of Toronto's artists, our arts organizations, and our citizens who enjoy the arts. This means that we are going to advocate to make sure that Toronto gets fair access to federal and provincial programs, and that all of our advocacy and programming is considered through an equity and human rights lens. Now is not the time to lose sight of these values. So as mentioned this week, uh, we wrapped up our TO Artist COVID-19 Response Fund. I'm delighted to report that 932 artists, in fact, every eligible applicant, received a funding totaling $836,000. $347. Uh, the fund was launched with $450,000 from Toronto Arts Council and Foundation combined. And in a very few weeks, it was remarkable and heartening. Individuals, foundations, and corporations donated an additional $386,347, which was enough to meet the immediate need. And there are so many remarkable stories in that. And there were some donors who came back week after week to keep on topping up uh, the fund. And we are going to continue to work through the foundation to encourage philanthropy and to encourage uh, corporations to keep up their important contributions to the arts sector in Toronto. Um, also worth noting is that Toronto Arts Council and Foundation are, are working with other partners, uh, particularly um, on research. Um, in particular Ryerton University on two research projects to bring about um, important support to arts organizations as you're all striving to manage in the face of this uncertainty. So one of them is called Lights On and this brings together key stakeholders to make sense of the current crisis, to synthesize and analyze all the data and the impact studies that are out there and and also then to develop and to communicate strategies for support as the sector begins to envision the future. The second one is called Q to Q, and that is going to draft guidelines for occupational and public health standards in performance venues during COVID recovery, particularly focused on the backstage end of things and rehearsal end of things, not the front of house. Very important. In addition to working on these programs and others, what we at uh, Toronto Arts Council and the Foundation have been doing most is listening. Listening to you as you let us know about the gaps that exist within the current funding programs and also to suggest new opportunities and a vision for the future. So uh, this past month has been very busy. And I have sat in on a number of grant assessment meetings where our arts committee members have shared their thoughts on issues that can strengthen the arts community and in particular advise us what TAC can do to help. We also recently convened uh, our TAC Leaders Lab alumni, which is now nearly 100 people, to ask them the same questions. And we are going to be continuing to find various formats, including today, to convene and consult with the community so we can listen and we can then push those questions to others to help find answers. We've also been meeting regularly with colleagues, both at the federal and local levels, as well as meeting uh, with other arts councils from across the country to share program plans. You know, we need to learn from others, and we also have to ensure that we're not working at cross purposes, um, and that we can con continue to communicate issues that are relevant to Toronto's artists and arts organizations. We've also met with our large and growing advocacy group, 
Network, which is exploring how we can work together to most effectively communicate the value of the arts and the specific needs of Toronto's arts community as it faces the challenges of COVID. And this advocacy will, of course, include communicating the need for additional investment in recovery efforts. So as part of these advocacy efforts, uh, we've assembled some data about the contribution that you, our not-for-profit arts organizations and artists, make to our national and provincial not-for-profit arts sector. So even I was surprised at just how significant Toronto's contribution is. So even though Toronto's population is just 8% of the country, our non-profit arts sector contributes 30% of Canada's earned revenue, 40% of the private sector revenue, 38% of the country's audiences, 25% of Canada's artists, and 30% of volunteers. You know, so in one scenario, a bleak scenario, but perhaps not the bleakest, but if we assume public events were to be cancelled to the end of 2020, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but if we were to assume that, the cumulative impact of Toronto's not-for-profit sector on Toronto would be at least $183 million lost ticket sales and earned revenue. 25,000 public performances and exhibitions would be cancelled or postponed, and this would deprive 20 million people of the, the joy of connecting directly with artists and artwork in galleries, theatres, concert halls, and other gathering spaces across the city. And of course, very importantly, this would be while our artists and arts workers would be losing $145 million in artist and production salaries and fees. Sobering. So I do want to reiterate that how appreciative we are for the emergency funding provided by the federal government, so responsive, so responsive to vulnerable workers. And the liquidity of it's provided through the advancement of grants from all levels will help. But I think we're all, we all know that to really enable recovery, other solutions and investments will need to be found. So as we proceed, all of us, um, I have to say that the board and staff at Toronto Arts Council and the foundation are committed to working with you, each and every one of you, to help you position Toronto for recovery. We will maintain our values and we will strive very hard to maintain our momentum and even gain on momentum on equity and inclusion. So where does this leave us at this time? We don't know if social distancing will end soon or continue for many, many, many months. We don't know if the public is allowed to congregate, whether they are allowed to congregate, whether the response will be reluctant or enthusiastic. We don't know how long before it is that tourists come back to Toronto. But we do know that if we are going to be more effective, we will need to work together to face the challenges. So please contact us at any time. I really look forward to hearing your needs, your concerns, and also your ideas and your suggestions. Thanks again for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. I think uh, we do also know that with leadership like yours and, and the rest of the panelists that uh, we can try and work together to that great new future. Um, thank you to MP De Bruyssen, Budget Chief Crawford, Pat Claire and David Kalenda. We received a number of very thoughtful questions from you, many of which were of course duplicated. So they've been grouped into separate topics and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. We put them in the order of the most popular. And the first one was about federal funding. Most asked questions about support for organizations that currently fall through the cracks. In, particularly, in particular, Sheena Robertson asked, what is being done to advocate for smaller arts organizations? SIBA doesn't apply to us because we do not pay our artists through payroll and the emergency support. Fund for cultural heritage and sports organizations doesn't apply to us because we are not already funded by Canada Council or Heritage. 
Uh, I'll hand that over to MP DeBruston and just add a lot of questions have been coming in since your statement about a little clarity about what existing client means. Sorry, hitting the unmute button. Um, so two things, why don't I go to the existing client piece and if you don't mind, I'm going to take a sheet just because there's a list, so it makes it a little easier. I'm going to read for this one. Um, so what it means is that you're a, a recipient, a current recipient right now from Heritage or Canada Council. And when I'm talking about Can Canadian Heritage, it's going to be a top up to recipients of the following arts and culture programs, the Canada Periodical Fund, Canada Book Fund, Canada Music Fund via Factor and Music Action, um, Canada Arts Training Fund, Canada Arts Presentation Fund, Harbors Front Center Funding Program, and Building Communities Through Arts and Heritage Program. I'm sorry for the piece of paper, but it was just, it was a bit of a list. So it, it gives you an idea of if you're a recipient of, of one of those programs or from Canada Council, then, then that is, is for phase one. But I think it's a really important question about what happens to those organizations that aren't covered or through, through, that, through that list. And so that's really where phase two comes in. And that's why I was trying to put the emphasis on phase one being about speed, getting, being able, these are existing programs, getting money out. But phase two, which will be, we're working on, and it is part of the 500 million, so it's already incorporated in there, um, is to, to try and get funding to others who are not within that recipient group. So that's the first part, and we will get you, I will get you those details um, when, as they become available. So that's for that part. But um, the other part of that question was about the uh, emergency bank account, the Canada Emergency Bank Account, which is for, for businesses. Uh, there are a few other programs that, that have been coming out that kind of wrap around a bit more most recently, but this is only if you're incorporated. Uh, there is the Regional Development Agency funding that was announced yesterday um, that would go for people who don't qualify for, for the existing wage subsidy or bank account. Uh, and also, uh, and Minister, um, Minister Ng mentioned it even today in the COVID committee, we recognize that there is a lot more to do. And so th there, you know, th this is where the feedback comes in as to where are those gaps and how can we continue to work towards them. So again, it really, the government's been focused on this phase right now. How do we help people, especially the most vulnerable, to get through this phase and, and where you can point out those gaps that that's actually very helpful to us as we're trying to meet those needs. And then the next is really working towards the recovery. Thank you. We also received several questions about when and how reopening will be possible. Mm -hmm. Does the city know when we should expect outdoor public space to reopen for events? And particularly, will this consider easing restrictions and fees for events in public spaces? Councillor Crawford, can I turn that one over to you? Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Nova, I appreciate the question. Um, the um, opening of open spaces really is focused on a provincial framework. Uh, I guess the best way I can describe it, uh, we're not gonna be flipping on the switch, but it'd be like a dimmer switch. It's slowly, gradually gonna be opening up. Um, so I'm gonna go through this three phases, and I think most people have heard that we are now in phase one, uh, which is really about protect and support. Um, and you're starting to see some uh, select uh, workplaces opening up. We have businesses curbside opening. Uh, I think the Premier even announced them today with golf course and tennis courts. Um, certain um, activities where physical distancing can be achieved will be opening up uh, in parks. Uh, we're looking at slowly opening up parks. Um, but again, this is all based on the Chief Medical Officer of Health's recommendation. Um, and I think it's going to be slow, unfortunately. Um, Phase two, phase three, uh, we're going to be opening up more workplaces and outdoor spaces, al allowing more large gathering. Uh, and again, phase three, um, we'll be continuing that. But challenge, of course, is when. I think everybody wants to know when, um, and I think we all do. I, I think the province, I think everybody wants to know. But again, it's dependent on a number of uh, critical, important junctures that we have to do. Uh, lowering the curve, of course, is one of them. Um, looking at consistent two to four week decrease in numbers. 
um, that are coming forth. And we're starting to see that. I think we're starting to see on the daily numbers there, there's a bit of an up and down, but they are pretty much coming down and a decrease in uh, cases coming to the hospital. Um, so I think we're starting to see that, but really what's important um, is the health and safety of workers. Um, and, and the province, again, has been clear, they are working as diligently and hard as they can, but they unfortunately can't, um, they, they won't be able to say when phase two is and when phase three is, that's dependent on many other factors that they are not in control of. Uh, but the one thing, and, and this is, comes from a lot of the conversations I've had with people, we may be able to turn on the switch, we may be able to open up um, all businesses, all opportunities uh, for gathering. But what we've heard very clearly, it's all about public confidence. Um, you can open up everything. You can open up restaurants, you can have all the theaters, you can have all the performing arts centers open up. But until people feel safe to go into them, they're not coming. Um, so I think, yes, we can look at a slow process and I think it has to be slow. And I think we have to look at how do we build public confidence over a period of time. We've now been two months into this. People are getting used to being inside, being used to um, going a little crazy, of course, but I think they're now getting used to that being the normal. And as people start going out, I think there's gonna be this new normal where they're gonna be very conscious of their health, conscious of people around them. And we have to take that into consideration as we're slowly opening. So I think it's a, it's a balanced approach um, that the provincial government has to do and all the other provinces too, but I think the Ontario government has to be a slow uh, approach. Um, with regard to um, fees, um, again, that uh, being the budget chief for the city of Toronto, recognizing we do have our financial challenges, we are looking at different ways that we can change processes. Fees will be one of them. Uh, again, th these aren't necessarily big ticket items when we're looking at finances, but they're incredibly important to um, you know, small and large organizations. So we're looking at a number of different ways on fees, on processes that we'll be able to enable to help support. And I'm recognizing a lot of this sometimes has to do if you're doing um, you're doing uh, some sort of show. Uh, time is of the essence when you're doing permits and ensuring that we can push through permits very, very quickly to enable you to, at the beginning, to the end of that process, as I said, is about time and it's about money. So we're looking at different creative ways to be able to do that uh, as part of the um, city's uh, obligation or, or work that we're trying to help you do. Thank you, Gary. We, this is a bit related, uh, but there's two separate questions. One came in from David Plant of Trinity Square Video asking, has the city considered the conditions that will have to be met before arts venues can open? Has anyone assessed what additional operating costs would be incurred in order to preserve a safe working environment for staff and visitors? And another question from Margaret Chasen asking, um, noting one of the greatest challenges will be the gap between box office revenue and fixed costs with much low attendance until after a vaccine. Will there be a provincial or federal subsidy to performing arts organizations to offset venue costs? And will the city consider a 50% subsidy for TO Live rentals? Pat, can I throw this to you? Sure, thanks Nova. Um, and noted that the Councilor Crawford did cover a lot of that. I'll take uh, Margaret's question first. Um, so uh, yeah, particularly performing arts, uh, share a number of challenges that even restaurants share. You've got high fixed costs, uh, relatively low margins, and therefore an inability to uh, change your business model to adjust to varying public health direction as that dimmer switch goes up. So we're very conscious uh, of that. Will there be specific uh, relief in the form that's described? I think uh, we are seeing some of this come from uh, the federal government. And we are seeing, uh, as the MP de Gruzin said, uh, a willingness to listen to where the gaps are and to try to close those gaps through changes to eligibility criteria. So uh, watching the feed of notes here, people please do continue to point out where those limitations are. Uh, that's incredibly helpful to all. Um, there is also good work that's, I'll just repeat, that has been mentioned here. Um, Claire mentioned the two pieces at Ryerson. So we are trying to uh, work to develop, um, access the best practices globally. That is, uh, Claire had it, could be applied either back of house or front of house for the performing arts, which would help address the consumer confidence question that, that Councillor Crawford uh, is pointing out. Um, but principally, this is a public health crisis. Uh, we'll take our direction from public health officials. Uh, there are a series of those criteria, the infection rate, health uh, care sector capacity, the public health infrastructure capacity that we will continue to watch and those changes 
principally led by the provincial emergency orders will play out and will adjust but we understand the role that uh, economic development and culture particularly uh, should play in assisting the sector to get access to timely and clear public health direction and assistance in how to apply that uh, in their in their given business setting uh, here in the culture sector as well uh, so we'll be working to, to play that role talking to you and talking to public health thank you pat patty jarvis has raised a question that i've certainly heard in many conversations i've been having with colleagues uh, she says, as a member of the Toronto arts community for 35 years, my greatest fear is that we will strive to return to the way it was and not learn from this experience. Is there or will there be opportunities through the TAC or the cultural office to strategize together what that future will be? I am particularly interested in the ways that we can and should work collaboratively to deliver programs and offset duplication. Claire, would you like to answer that one? I'd be delighted. <laughs> this is one of my favorite topics. And, um, you know, and, and it's perfect coming from Patty because uh, Patty and uh, Christine Jackson came to the Toronto Arts Council a number of years ago with an idea for a new platform or new collaboration to allow more uh, artists to work in schools. And uh, as a result, TDSB creates is this fantastic program. So um, that was uh, partly, uh, and thank you, Gary, the new money that came in from the city that afforded us that opportunity to fund that TDSB creates program. But also, uh, so I would have to say our open door program is exactly that kind of program where we're really looking for the community to come to us with these collaborative ideas. Let us let us find opportunity in this crisis uh, to reduce duplication and back-end duplication in particular, to collaborate more together. Certainly there's an enormous amount of sharing of information and an openness co to collaborate. And um, you know, we're not a top-down organization, we are responding to your ideas. So uh, we can have the conversation with you, but also we can accept the applications from you with these ideas. Um, whether there would be a more structured, even more structured than say open door program to, uh, to come to is yet to be decided. Uh, again, we are, that's why I was referring earlier so much that we are listening to and we want the ideas because it is the arts community as we found time and time again, who are going to come up with the imaginative creative solutions that are very specific to the, either the disciplines or the size or the scale of operation, you're the ones who actually know what could, what collaborations are effective and possible. Um, so let us use this time for reflection for many organizations because they're not in the hurly-burly of opening night, though many of course are doing very, very good work on digital, but let us use this time to reflect and think um, of how we can resume um, with better connections, better partnerships, more collaboration, less time wasted on, on the min minutia that seems to, you know, to take everybody's time so much. I won't go on, but thanks very much, Patty, for that question. And that is a challenge back to all of you out there. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Continuing in that vein, Komen Poon also rejects the idea of a return to normal and says, we have before us an opportunity to reinvent and innovate and lead in a new way that celebrates human expression. How do we begin to reimagine this potential future? How do we build a different set of values and conditions for the creation and propagation of art? In addition, other question, questioners wanted to know how the community will be invited to give input on planning for the future. Pat or Claire? Sure, thanks Nova. I'll, I'll start past to Claire. Um, absolutely, I think there's a growing consensus um, uh, for the people that I'm working with, be they councillors uh, or senior city staff, uh, that the scale of this challenge does not allow for uh, an easy rush back to the status quo, 
but affords rather an opportunity to try to figure out what a reset might look like. And I think you're seeing a shift in language, uh, even from recovery, which might suggest more return to the status quo into things like rebuild, reset, um, reimagine. Um, I think uh, figuring out what are the, the big pieces that need to be worked on has been an incredibly uh, useful process with the cultural sector roundtables. We've touched a bit on what people have been asking for, but in one roundtable with youth arts leaders, just to choose one, uh, they talked about from their own client base, uh, a growing sense of hopelessness with respect to job prospects, uh, economic prospects in the creative sector. Uh, and, uh, and certainly that's visceral for them, but they scaled it back out quite quickly to say that, look, uh, the talent pathways that have existed in the city for 25 years have fed effectively today a virtuous cycle where you know, Toronto's cultural output uh, is known around the world uh, and people want to come here and there are all kinds of important uh, effects of that on our economy, on the livability of our city, uh, on our diversity model. Uh, and that we can't let that unravel uh, in a rush to try to uh, restore uh, perhaps what exists. Um, so it's really, really important to think forward, you know, not just five years, 10 years, but 25 years and think about what structural things can we work on now that will set us up for success. Uh, we'll close the gaps that existed prior even to COVID-19 crisis uh, and that are in line with uh, where the the art sector uh, is going and where the rest of the world is going because uh, there is, uh, Toronto has significant, significant ranks that uh, coming out of this, um, I think we can, we can work to, to not be naive about this, but I think we can work to shore up and come out uh, stronger and having addressed some deficits that had accumulated. If I can jump in as well, um, thanks so much for this question because of course a lot of us are thinking about this and at the TAC Leaders Lab this particular question has been circul circulating for a number of years um, and we, while we have seen great progress over the last few years with um, an increase in the number of diverse voices afforded opportunity and the ensuing benefits of that, the, the, the fantastic works that have come out of that. Um, it has offered us great hope for the future, but we're also understanding that, that wages for artists are so abysmally low and how expensive it is to live in Toronto. So when we, when we look at this, reset this reimagine both sides both these issues really need to be tackled head-on because um, not only is it about affording opportunity but it has to be good opportunity it has to be sustainable opportunity um, and so again i'm going to go back to we we can be a vehicle we can be a platform for um, steering some funding through, but it is the ideas and the energy, the ideas of how to do this, and the energy of leadership in the field to make this happen, and that we need to work together to 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 accomplish this. Um, and you know, I've been watching the chat room questions, and 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 it's fantastic. And we're going to post these questions and try to answer them as many as possible. But it's exactly this dialogue which does drive change. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. And when you talk about the energy level of the leaders, it's also great to hear you talking about reflection, because mm -hmm. I think that's a big concern in the community community that will have to suddenly come up with all the solutions right now and to know that the councils in the city are valuing that we will need to take time and reflect on these issues is really important. Can I just, but, uh, can I, can I, yeah. Nova, can I just elaborate on that because I think it is important and I've heard it from many. There is no expectation from the Toronto Arts Council and most likely other arts councils too that we are expecting people to replicate their artistic product in different forms if they so choose, and it is a wonderful experiment and a wonderful expansion of audience engagement, 
fantastic. But there is this time also to spend the time on reflecting for the bigger issues as well. And I think the flexibility of arts councils in particular in, in understanding that all true ideas and creativity really come from this time of reflection and crisis often. So we want to assure you that we understand that this time is necessary to really uh, tackle some of the bigger questions. So I, I did want to, to underscore that. So thank you for saying that, Nova. We are coming to the endish of our time, so we'll try and uh, plow through what's left. Uh, there was a specific question about uh, digitization. So Guillermo Silva Martin asked if there will be any support or assistance with digitization for small arts organizations with limited capacity. Pat, do you want to talk about that and tie it into the program you've launched, the city's launched? Sure, Nova. I'll be brief knowing the endish times are near. Um, the, so first, Guillermo, uh, in response, I mentioned Shop Here, uh, which is the initiative with Shopify that uh, helps people access e-commerce tools uh, and uh, technical development help to build websites to do so. So we'll circulate that link, um, or if you, if you Google it, you'll get it. Uh, there's capacity to onboard uh, some 30,000 organizations, uh, but it will be popular. So I'd encourage people to look and, and uh, take advantage. Uh, with MP de Bruzen on the call, um, it's been great to, to have a dialogue with the Canada Council uh, for the Arts with respect to Digital Strategy Fund. Toronto to date has benefited 37% you know, uh, of all funds available, which is, is a good track record. And uh, we've been in dialogue about how that fund might um, adjust, and you've already seen some of that, uh, to ensure that the pivot people have made digitally uh, is both sustainable but drives long-term sector adaptation and digital transformation. So that's a really active conversation with federal funders to include how they might consider the eligible categories for their infrastructure programs. Uh, the last I, I mentioned is a lot of good collaboration work arts at home uh, was mentioned and then uh, digital transformation certainly will be a pillar of the actual culture sector recovery strategy. Uh, so more to come from the city uh, on that in the coming weeks. Thank you, Pat. Thank you all for your questions. And thank you, MP DeBrusen, Councillor Crawford, Pat Tobin, Claire Hopkinson, and David Kalenda. As was the case with the previous webinar, we will be making both the transcript and the recording available, and we'll send the links out to everyone. As Claire mentioned, there will also be an attempt to answer the remaining questions that have come in through the chat format. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and keep your spirits bright. Thank you. Thank you, Nova. Thank you all.